So when I was looking at like uh, lists of speakers and ladies that we've had to come and teach, I don't, I didn't tell Mary, but she's like on the top of the list for the number of times that she's been here, because she's my buddy and she's uh, my lunch partner. Not way, not nearly as often as we want to. You have those friends who you go, I, we got to get together, and then it just happens. My cousin Kathy's here, we do that too. She only lives like an hour and a half away. We gotta get together, we gotta get together and then time just passes by, but Mary and I keep in close touch. She's from Calvary Chapel, Cyprus. She's an awesome, um, godly lady and a good friend and I know a lot of you know her already, feel like she's part of you. So um, welcome Mary Stevens. Wouldn't you just love it if one time she, she gave someone a hug and went, whoa, falling over backwards off the stairs. <laughs> okay, this is a mother may I. Oh, that would be me. That would be me. Okay, this is a mother may I. And when I ask the question, if it's you, you have to stand up and then sit down, okay? This is to get the blood going. We're just going to do this for a couple of minutes. It's to get the blood going. Okay, if you ate Mexican food, stand up and then sit down. Okay, if you had Italian food, stand up, sit down. Chinese food, okay, Italian food, American food, all right, French fries, a salad, okay, we all have to applaud you, salad people, okay. Okay, well, as you see, I come up with loads of notes because God has been changing my study this past week so many times, and so I thought, well, including this morning, so I thought, well, that's okay, because I'm just going to bring them all, and I'm sure that God will speak, and by the time the study is over, we'll all know what the Holy Spirit wanted me to say, and so in all seriousness, however... We will pause for just a moment in prayer while I, oh yeah, tissue paper in case I just break down and start crying halfway through because who knows where I am. Okay. <laughs> and why do I have notes and not just wing it? Because I've been in 17 car accidents. Anybody want me to drive you to lunch next time? <laughs> But I haven't been driving in all of them. Um, uh, but I have had two very serious head injuries, which means that, and people know this who work with me at church, we'll just be carrying on a normal conversation and then I'll just forget what we're talking about. And so I write things down because this is my, my security blanket. Okay, so with that, we're going to get off the subject of me and trust in the Holy Spirit to have his work this day. Father, because it is not of me, Holy Spirit, come and as you have been, fill us afresh. I ask, Lord, that in your mercies, totally override any inadequacies of the flesh that I might have. And Lord, we come to you, each of us, like Peter, where else would we go? You alone have the words of life, Jesus. And so, Holy Spirit, continue to do that work. Open up our hearts. Take away any protections that we have put up, artificial protections, and free us, God. Free us from ourselves that we might be open before you, vulnerable before you, that you might heal us, that you might encourage us, that you might inspire us. Do whatever the work is that you have brought each one of us here. To you be the glory, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, the theme 
that I was given. Of course, today's theme is whispers of worship from the Psalms. So when I'm given a topic or a scripture, the first thing that I do is I start with a word study because you all know, it, well, if you know me at all, I'm just like a word junkie. And so I will go to dictionaries and thesauruses and I will look up the words. And then the next thing that I do is I will go to concordances and I will try to find the words where they are used in other verses and hopefully in the same context that they are used uh, in the title or in the verse that I've been given. So, whispers, whispers of worship, it's a verb, so obviously it, we know what it is as a verb. It's using the breath, but using it so lightly, so softly, as to not use the vocal cords. Uh, it's used usually indicating a type of secrecy, uh, intimacy when it is being used. Going on with the definitions, I went on to uh, look up the Hebrew meaning of the word worship, and I found four meanings. Uh, one of them actually had two parts to it. So the first meaning um, was one that you all are probably familiar with, and it was to bow down or to stoop. It was to fall down face down onto the ground to prostrate oneself in homage to God. And that's when you just, you just throw yourself down, like in worship. Now, obviously, we didn't throw ourselves down on the ground, but I know because I could hear the singing being up front here. I can hear it behind me. And I could hear that so many of you just in your heart were throwing yourselves upon the floor and just saying, God, I love you, take all of me. And it's just a beautiful form of worship. The second definition of worship is to humbly beseech. Love those old English words. Beseech or to ask. But let's break that into two parts because the word humbly should be taken by itself, looked at by itself humbly. In Romans 12, Paul encourages the believers, you can look that up later tonight. In Romans 12, Paul encourages the believers to have the right view of themselves in relationship to God and to others. So in other words, if we're talking about humbly going to God, and asking for something, that means that when I go to God, I don't go to God and say, oh, oh, God, you know, I've been a really good girl this week. <laughs> and so I really think that you ought to grant me my prayers. Or, God, you know, I've been really good uh, in tithing, and so I really think that you owe me answering some prayers. Uh, or, God, you know, I've been walking a lot better walk, and I, after all, serve in the children's ministry, and I've seen the way you've been answering their prayers. They don't even work in the children's ministry. So you really ought to answer my prayers. Or if you don't answer my prayers, I'm really going to start pouting, and I'm going to take my cookies and go play somewhere else. That is not humbleness. Having a right view of myself when I come before God in prayer is to close my eyes, and I have to do this with my eyes closed so that, so I don't look like a complete idiot. You guys close your eyes too, okay? <laughs> it's going before God and just taking that moment and going, oh Lord, I remember that before I was even formed in my mother's womb, you loved me, but that when I was born when I was being formed in my mother's womb. Psalm 139 tells me I was, I was shaping in iniquity and that when I was born, I was born that I had inherited my forefathers, Adam's sinful nature, and that as I was growing up, I loved sin more than light, and that as I got into my teenage years, I began to run in riotous excess and I, I remember as I look back in my life I, I can see now God how 
you were protecting me and, and even in those years you were beginning to draw me to you with your loving kindness and your goodness and you were beginning to let me see the emptiness in my heart because I was trying to make those wise decisions but I was just bringing destruction upon myself until it came to that moment where you sent that person who shared with me that I could never get to heaven by, by trying to do good things or going to church on Sunday, that, that there, there wasn't any righteousness in and of my own self that would be enough to qualify me for heaven, but that you had sent your son to die for my sins and that if I would just believe it, if I would just accept that gift, that, that you would wash away all my sins. And I did, God. And so now, Lord, now you choose to view me, not, not the way I see myself. I see myself as still struggling with these habits of sin. Oh, God, even as I come before you today, I, I've sinned already today a multitude of times. I've compromised. I've willingly sinned. But you choose to view me as washed by the blood of the Lamb. You choose to view me as clothed in the righteousness of your Son. And because of that, you've given me the right to come into your presence with boldness. And so I do, God. I humbly come before you and say, oh, Abba, Father, I'm a wretched sinner, but saved by that amazing grace and your love. May I come and sit on your knee and beseech you this day. I have a list. <laughs> May I have some water, please? So that's humbly. The second part of humbly beseech is beseech. Oh, beseech is a wonderful word. I can just see like, oh, I beseech you, I beseech you. <laughs> but that's not what beseech is. It's a, it's a very strong word. It means to implore with urgency, with fervency. Did a bell just go off in your head? Oh, yes. James 5.16 the fervent prayer of a righteous woman availeth much. That's right. And it means with great seriousness. I read this in one of um, Charles Spurgeon's books. Great pastor, teacher, author. Uh, had the metropolitan uh, pulpit back in the mid to late 1800s. Um, and he said, I will not go before God with my prayer until I have found scriptures to base it on. And then when I go before the presence of the Almighty God, I order my case like a lawyer. And I say, Lord, does your word not say? Then, Father, honor your word. I know that you say you honor your word. And yet, I humbly ask according to your will. So you see the deference according to your will. You talk about having confidence in prayer. <laughs> so, number two, humbly beseech. Number three, third part of the definition for worship is reverence. Reverence is to have awe. You go out into the desert in the middle of the summer, you go out about midnight, and you away from all the lights and you look up into that midnight sky and you see all those stars and you go <gasps> takes your breath away and then you think but I know the living God who knows the stars by name who holds them in the span of his hand 
do we go before our Heavenly Father and does it take our breath away? <gasps> you are the King of Kings, God Almighty, the Eternal One. <clears throat> to have respect, to admire, to esteem, to love, to have devotion, to have devotion, to have devotion. The fourth definition for worship is make obeisance. Again, another one of those lovely old English words. Roger's thesaurus gives synonyms, allegiance, loyalty, deference. Now, I will be repeating these words throughout. We're going to be looking at David's life, and I will be repeating these words. So if, you're, if you haven't caught them all, I will be repeating them. So allegiance, loyalty, deference. You know, and I thought, this is very interesting because this is almost akin to um, what goes on when you have a marriage, marriage vows. Because actually what I kind of saw in this was akin to when I married my husband, because what I was doing at that time when I said I do was I was yielding my individual sovereignty as a woman over to my husband. And I was saying, I will obey you, I will follow you. So you see, I was yielding my sovereignty over to him when I said I do. Same thing uh, for God with this allegiance, loyalty, and deference. The definition of it is dutiful obedience. It is my duty to be obedient to God. That is part of worship. So here are the questions. If one's allegiance and loyalty has been given to God, when one says, you are my Savior and my Redeemer, when we pray the sinner's prayer, if we defer our will to him when we say, you are now my Lord, I will follow you, take my life, it's no longer mine. You have redeemed me. You have broken the chains that have held me, the chains of sin that have held me. If we agree that obedience is our spiritual duty to God, then our lives will be changed. Serious vow we take when we pray the sinner's prayer. So, now what we're going to do is, um, if you have a scrap of paper, I'm going to give you some things to write down. Look them up later, because right now I'm going to race through them. Oh, yeah, I'm going to race through them. Okay. <laughs> we are going to be looking at 1 Samuel chapters 19 through 22. Just take it as a blank statement. Go home and read them on your own. 1 Samuel 19 through 22. This is telling events that took place in David's life. Just to let you know, it was two years after he had killed Goliath, but it was before he became king. Out of this portion, he wrote four psalms. Four psalms. Uh, Psalm 59, 56, 34, and 52. I will repeat it as we go through it, because we have to jump in or... I'm going to take up all of Nogme's time, and frankly, I want to hear what Nogme has to say. <laughs> okay. So, um, I'm just going to jump right into it. First Samuel 19. Things are not going very well. 
Oh, boo. Before I do that, I want one sample. I, I want to read you one thing. Stop turning pages. <laughs> I want to give you one example of how our lives should be changed. One example of how our lives should be changed. Okay. 2 Samuel 15, don't turn there. 2 Samuel 15, 22. Uh, King Saul had gone off to war. Samuel the prophet said, God says, when you go to war, don't bring back anything. No spoils of war. Um, Saul, of course, did not obey. So when the prophet Samuel went out to meet Saul, he went, what's this I hear, the bleeding of sheep? And Saul said, yeah, uh, the, uh, yeah, because I brought it back to sacrifice it to the Lord. And, Saul, and the prophet Samuel said, does God have as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed what God has said than the fat of rams, okay? Second example, because we're looking at two examples and I want us to figure out which one is truly worshiping God. If dutiful obedience is a form of worship, which one is truly obeying God? In Matthew 26, verses 36 through 46, and I'm shortening it, Jesus went to a place called Gethsemane. He went a little further, he fell on his face. He prayed saying, oh my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. With King Saul. It didn't matter how beautifully that sacrifice was offered to God. It was offered and his heart was disobedient. God has no pleasure when sacrifices are offered and the heart is disobedient. Let me just say one thing. I am ashamed of how many times I have sat in the pews at church with a sin, you know, here's my heart, here's the, here's the throne of my heart where God should always reign supreme, and here's my rebellion. And I can sing and raise my hands and then even go off and do my ministry, and only God and I know that my will, be it a goal I want or a relationship I want or a aura, aura, whatever it is, a covetousness I want, or unforgiveness, or whatever the sin is, that I am not submitting to God. And God is going, I don't want the sacrifice of worship. I want your heart. We'll talk about the answer to that at the very end. With Jesus, in light of what I told you about worship, he came to a place called Gethsemane. He went a little further, fell on his face. That is definition number one, casting oneself face down onto the ground in homage to God. He prayed, saying to, he prayed, saying to the Father, that's humbly beseeching, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yes, urgently imploring God with fervency, with great seriousness. Nevertheless, not as I will. That's that deference. It's not my will, God. It is your will. But as you will. And then we know he stood up from there and he walked off in obedience, a living sacrifice for all of our sins. Now, 1 Samuel. 
1 Samuel 19, again, it's been a few years since David slew Goliath. Saul resents David. Did I say Saul slew Goliath? I might, but it was David. <laughs> Saul resents David. Currently, David's not in court when uh, chapter 19 begins. And Saul is trying to convince his son David and his servants that they should kill. Excuse me. Slow down, Mary. Saul is trying to convince his son Jonathan and also his servants that they should kill David. But Jonathan warns his friend, David, to hide, and he intercedes on David's behalf. And he tells Saul, David hasn't done anything wrong, and Saul agrees. So he brings David back into court, and in verse 8, war starts again. David goes out, whoops the Philistines, comes back home, and in verse 9 is the very famous uh, thing where he is sitting before Saul, he is playing music, Saul picks up his spear and he tries to spear David to the wall with his javelin, but David escapes. Now in verse 11, verse 11, I'm going to read it to you, it is from verse 11 that Psalm 59 is written. Saul also sent messengers to David's house to watch him and to kill him in the morning. And Michael, who was Saul's daughter, David's wife, told him, saying, if you do not save your life tonight, tomorrow you will be killed. So as we look, I will tell you, read it tonight for yourselves. As you look tonight at Psalm 59 in verses 1 and 2, you see David coming to God very humbly and um, beseeching God, deliver me from my enemies, O oh God, O oh God, be my fortress. O oh God, deliver me from evildoers. Save me from those who are after my blood. In verse 3, he states the case. See how they lie and wait for me. Fierce men conspire against me for no offense or sin of mine, Lord. And then in verses um, 4 and 5, there's more of this humbly beseeching, which again is number 2 of worship. Um, I've done no wrong, but you, Lord God Almighty, see, he knows who God is. You, you are the God of Israel. Rouse yourself. And then down uh, in verses 9 and 10, you are my strength. I'm watching for you. You, God, you are my fortress, my God, on whom I can rely. So you see his allegiance, you see his loyalty. He's not, he's not looking at himself for, how can I get myself out of this? Who can I go to? Who, what resources? He's going to God. Look at his choices. I watch for you. You are my fortress. You are my God. I can rely upon you. You read that verbiage in light of what's going on in 1 Samuel 19. It's very interesting in light of worship. So then we go on. Uh, let's see if my notes will help me. Okay, then uh, 1 Samuel chapter 20, things go from bad to worse. In 21, um, let me see, in 21, uh, let me see, well, Going back to 19, verse 18, David fled and escaped. He went to Samuel at Ramah. He told him all that Saul had done to him. I love David. I have a son and a daughter. My daughter is my boy, and as far as she just goes, oh, yeah, we'll make it so. And my son is like David. Mom, I just needed to call you and talk to my mom. It's okay, Justin. God is on the throne. It's going to work out. Let's pray. <laughs> But in Psalm 21, verse 1, David came to Nob. Nob. Nob was the city of priests, to Ahimelech the priest. Now Ahimelech is afraid. 
When he met David, he said to him, why are you alone and no one is with you? He talks to Ahimelech and he says, why are you alone? And David lies. Down in verse 6, Ahimelech gives David the showbread, the holy bread. He gives him Goliath's sword. But in verse 7, there is someone who is watching this, a certain Edomite, a certain chief servant of Saul, and that's going to have serious ramifications later on. But down in verse 10, verses 10 through 15, we're, I'm going to read that to you because out of 1 Samuel 21, verses 10 through 15, David then pens Psalm 56. What time am I supposed to be done? 2.30. Oh, we can do this. Okay. Verse 10, then David arose and fled that day from before Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. And the servants of Achish said to him, the king, is this not David, uh, the king of the land? Did they not sing of him to one another in dances, saying, Saul is slain his thousands and David is ten thousands? Now David took these words to heart and was very much afraid. That means like terrified of Achish, the king of Gath. So he changed his behavior before them, pretended madness in their hands, scratched on the doors of the gate, let his saliva fall down his beard. Then Achish said to his servants, look, you see this man is insane. Why have you brought him to me? Have I need of madmen that you brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? Huh, interesting, interesting. Now let's go back for a sec to the title, Whispers of Worship, and the definition of whispers. Why whispers? Whispers are not the usual method of communication. One of the reasons for whispers is when someone is underneath duress. Um, I remember, because I'm an old horse, I remember in 1978 when um, the embassy was attacked in Iran and they took our people um, captive. One of the fellows who came home had throat cancer a couple of years later and he was not aware of it because he was never allowed to speak. That, for some reason, that really stuck in my head. So when I was thinking of why whisper, I thought, not allowed to speak. So I'm thinking, whisper sometimes can happen when you're not allowed to speak. Okay, here is David. David is freaked out. He's going before the king. I don't think he consults God. I think he just does the first thing on his mind. And he just goes, blah, 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 and whatever else, scratching. <laughs> but on the way out, you had better believe that he is going, I'm going to say it, but he is whispers of worship. Thank you, God, thank you, God, thank you, God, thank you, God. I can't believe it. I got out of there. God, you delivered me. Thank you so much. Whispers of worship. Nobody could hear it, but you bet his heart is overflowing. I'll give you a better example. So, like, I'm driving 80 miles an hour because I'm late, and uh, the guy in front of me just decides to stomp on his brakes. I know not why. And the Lord keeps me from ending up in his truck bed. Now, it was not God sanctioning me to be breaking the speed limit, but that's why I don't have any Jesus stickers on my vehicle. Um, <laughs> it was not God sanctioning me to break the speed limit, but when I did not end up in his truck bed, you better believe I went... Thank you, God. Praise you, God. I immediately thanked the Lord. Well, I think that David was probably doing that same thing. Now, 
Let's go back, however, and read what he had to say in Psalm 56. I will read it to you. Now, this is at a later time, and he's thinking. He starts out kind of by stating his case in verse 1 and 2. Be merciful to me, O God. Man would swallow me up. Fighting all day, he oppresses me. My enemies would hound me all day. There are many who fight against me almost high. And then... He's talking about how he is beset physically, okay? It's just like, I'm, they just, they're fighting me, they're oppressing me, they're fighting against me, God. And then, but he says some interesting words. In verse 3, he says, whenever I'm afraid. See, he knows why he drooled in his beard. He was afraid. Fear caused him To not act like the young man who went up to Goliath and said, You uncircumcised Philistine, how dare you? Fear made him behave in a way that he did not slay his tens of thousands. Fear made him behave in a way, well, nobody says, Oh, wasn't David magnificent when he drooled in his beard? So here he is a bit later, and he's going, oh, God, whenever I'm afraid, and I think that's number two, humbly. I think he saw himself truthfully. He goes on to say, I will trust in you. Verse 4, in God, I will praise his word. In God, I have put my trust, that rededication. I will not fear. What can flesh do to me? It's verses 3 and 4 is a fresh statement of faith. In verses 5 and 6, he, he says, I'm beset almost psychologically, whereas he was beset physically. All day they're fighting me, they're oppressing me, they're fighting me again. Uh, but in verses 5 and 6, he says, They twist my words. Their thoughts against me are for evil. They hide. They mark my steps. They lie in wait. It's kind of almost, you know, this psychological thing of, he's kind of sounds like, what is that? Paranoid. It almost sounds, you know, like paranoid. Um, down, in, down in verse 8, he says, Oh, Lord, you number my wanderings. You put my tears into your bottle. Are they not in your book? You saw where I went. You heard what I said. You saw what I did. When I acted out of my own adrenaline, fight or flight, when I acted out of my own wisdom, oy vey. What I should have done verses 9 through 11, when I cry out to you, then my enemies, they will turn back. This I know because God is for me. And isn't that our word today? Ladies, write down on a scrap of paper somewhere Psalm 56, 9, because that's for each of you. God is for me. God is for me. I don't care if you don't have another living soul on this earth who is for you. God is for me. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He sees the end from the beginning. He's got all of your tomorrows. He, he's, he has you in his arm. He has you clenched to his bosom. He loves you, and every time you doubt it, look at Jesus. Look what he did on the cross. You think? God's going to let you down now when Jesus hung on that cross and suffered for every single sin you've ever done and will ever do? No. God is for you. 
Verse 10, in God I will, it's a choice, praise his word. In the Lord I will, again, praise his word. Verse, I, again in verse 11, I have put my trust. I will not be afraid. Verse 3, afraid. Verse 11, be afraid. What can man do to me? And then in verse 12, the vows made to you are binding upon me, O God. And there is that number four of living worship, dutiful obedience, allegiance, and loyalty, our choice to trust in God and to walk in living worship. I will render praises to you. And when we walk in living worship, our very life, renders praises to him. Finally, verse 13, for you have delivered my soul from death. You have not kept my, have you not kept my feet from falling that I may walk before God in the land of the living. So, we then move on. Maybe. Do we? Oh, we do move on. Okay. <laughs> Another thing. From uh, 1 Samuel 21, excuse me, from 1 Samuel 21, the verses that we have just read, verses 10 through 15, also keep going in Psalm 34 all the way through to... 1 Samuel 22, verse 2. So all the verses that we just read, and then over into verse 22, all the way to verse 2. David therefore departed, escaped to the cave of Adullam. So when his brothers and all his farmer's house, father's house heard about it, they went down there to him, and everybody who was in distress, who was in debt, who was discontented, gathered to him, so he became captain, captain over them, and there were about 400 men with him. And from there, Psalm 34, wonderful psalm. We love, as a matter of fact, we often sing Psalm 34, I will bless the Lord at all times, and this time it's not whispers of worship. It is raucous in the best sense of the word. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Why? Because he had failed, he had repented, he had learned, he had been restored, he was now sharing the things that he had learned. Listen to verse 4. I sought the Lord. He heard me. He delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him, were radiant. Their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around all those who fear him, that reverential awe, and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the woman who trusts in him. And here again is that number three of reverence. Oh, reverence the Lord, you his saints. There is no want or lack to those who reverence him. Young lions, those that we think have everything going for them. They lack, they suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall lack no good thing. Let me just skim through. Because he goes on to say, God will go before me. I will sing of your strength. In the morning I will sing of your love for you are my refuge. You are my fortress, my refuge in times of trouble. You are my strength. I will sing praise to you. Do you see all these decisions that he is making, these choices? 
These choices are often not choices given to us while circumstances are lovely. These are the choices that we have to make when you get the phone call that says, oh, you've been praying trying to figure out whether it, I can use this as an example because it's a perfect example. Oh, why not? So I'm praying that God will take care of this horrible situation that's going on within the family, and I'm going, oh, God, please just do the good for this person, and then I get the phone call, this person has landed in jail. Yeah, but this person is a young teenager. And I'm going, this is the way you answer? This is the way you answer? And God says, am I good? Yes, you're good. Do you believe that I'm answering your prayer? Yes, I believe you're answering the prayer. What are you looking at right now? The circumstance. Look up. Look up. Do you trust me? I trust you, God. Then don't look at the circumstance and praise me for being at work in this situation. And you know what? By eight hours later, I find out that there is something good coming out of a 15-year-old ending up in jail. Poof! So anyhow, these are choices we have to make when it's the darkest of night and when the phone call comes that just makes you just feel like a cannonball shot through your guts. You know, you are my strength. You are my fortress. You are my refuge. My God on whom I can rely. So, in conclusion, Oh, we did it. Didn't think we could. <laughs> what is God saying to us today? I hear Nagme say three words Wake up, bride. And she says, come unto me and ask, out of Psalms 2, tell my people to pray. But I also hear her say, unless we are willing to carry the cross, we're not really following God. We love comfortable Christianity, but last time I checked, the cross is an instrument of death. And if we are not willing to die to ourselves, then we are not serious about our Christianity. We are just pew sitters. And the last time I checked, there were ten virgins. Five were wise and five were just playing at it. And when the bridegroom came, only the five virgins who were keeping oil in their lamps and their wicks trimmed were the five that were able to go. To the others he said, I, I don't know you. Um, so, and that's not to make us be fearful. That's just to say, God, where else would we go? You alone have the words of life. I, like David, I want to go with you because I want the abundant life Jesus said you have come to give me, not just in the sweet by and by, but right now on this life, I need it. I want it. I'm willing to die to this life. If I can know you, Andrea, to have joy, and I thought of scriptures, um, joy is described, the scripture says, inexpressible, full of joy, great joy, fullness of joy. Jesus said, I give you my joy, to have joy and peace. Peace that passes understanding, perfect peace, that's complete peace, mature peace. Jesus again said, my peace I give to you, to have joy and peace in this world. Yeah, that's what we're all after or else we'd be kicking back at home. So what is the reason for whispers? 
sometimes it's because of tribulation. Um, uh, sometimes I, I think that, um, you know, as, as sometimes it's because, you know, okay, so sometimes it's because of tribulation and I think of Nagme's husband and I think that there are times in that prison when he was not allowed to worship God audibly but in his heart he was worshiping the Lord and, and out of his mouth would flow silent worship that just the walls fell away from the prison and the angels were there and the heavens opened and like with Stephen it's just like he looked up and could see God and the angels were rejoicing with him yes there are times when the whispers of worship have angels singing along with there are times when it's duress but there are other times when uh, as with David I can just see him and the conviction of the sin and the shame and the whispers of worship are like his head is buried in his arm because of the shame. I was afraid, but I know you, God, and I know there's no reason for me to be ashamed. I mean, I know there's no reason for me to be um, afraid. Oh, but he went to God and he knew that God says, that's okay. And just like with us, in 1 John it says, God is faithful and just to forgive us. If we go to him for repentance, I know that there are some women that, that they have whispers of worship because they've been so beaten down that they are afraid to go to God and say, I have blown it again. You know, in Psalm 51, David said, um, after that whole thing with Bathsheba, you know, where he killed Uriah, and, and um, then God um, required the baby of him. Oh. Woo! Never mind. And he said, God, I confess my blood guiltiness. There are some women who have had abortions who just feel like I can never really be clean. But you know what? You are. You are, you are. Because God is faithful and just. You go to him for cleansing. Jesus paid the price. Your infant is in heaven. Rejoicing with the angels. There is no shame. Jesus has washed you clean. Put that sin as far as the east is from the west. Never to be brought up again. Don't let the enemy the accuser, bring it up again. So you see, there are many different reasons for worship. Oh, you should have heard the other study that I had on <laughs> whispers of worship. Eh, it's another study. So anyhow, what God told me this morning, I go, why this, why this? He says, I've held up David with all his imperfections because David was a man after my own heart. He was a bloody man. He was responsible for a lot of bad stuff. But he came to me. He would always come to me and repent. I want the women to realize I'm not looking for super saints. I'm just looking for women who will give me their heart, who will walk as Romans 12:1 says. I beseech you, therefore, sisters. Seventeen car accidents later. I beseech you, therefore, sisters, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, your dutiful obedience, your living worship. That's what God wants. And this is the last thing that he said to me this morning. He said, I'm coming soon. So when Nagme said, wake up, bride, I went. Father, I pray for all of us. We hear your voice speaking.
may we not leave this building and leave the messages. May we write it in our hearts. May we write it in our minds. May we live it. May we breathe it by the power of your Holy Spirit. May it change us. Have mercy upon us, God. And may we be worshipful children, a sanctified bride unto your Son, ready for that day when you come to take us home to the marriage feast of the Lamb. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, bless you, Lord.